Welcome back to Relay Gun Adventures. So um, let's have a first look at this Air Arms TX200 HC, which is a Hunter carbine. Let's get it down. This is a Mark II TX200 HC in a beach stock. Um, the only thing that would give this away um, between the Mark II and the Mark III is probably the stock. The checkering on these is checkered and on the newer ones it's laser engraved in a sort of a oh it's a like a fish scale kind of pattern i suppose which is very attractive now this one is a 2005 model um it's had a new spring and it's had a bit of a service it's a very accurate very effective hunting rifle um it's probably it's probably one of the best hunting air rifles around. I was going to say the best, um, but I'm very aware that I also own an SW77K, which I'm very fond of, and of course my Dyna 52, which I am deeply in love with. This is possibly a better air rifle. It pains me to say so, but that is probably the case. Uh, this one's sporting a Bushnell Legends scope, which is kind of in keeping. It's a nice scope, and um, I've been trying to decide which rifle to keep it on. This, I think, is the one. Now, this rifle doesn't come with any form of open sights. You need a scope. It doesn't come with open sights because it's not that kind of rifle. It's not meant for um, short range, like over tin cans and the like. It is a very well-built, well-engineered rifle. It's British, um, other than the Italian stock and the German barrel. It's a very, well, one of the things that people often say about these is that they're a, a rip-off, a copy of the, the Virac HW77K, which was a game changer and possibly one of the most famous rifles in existence. That's not strictly true. Um, yes, Virac did it first. Um, possibly. Uh, certainly the Chinese Dragon Rifles did it before Virac. Um, what's happened is that a, a very good system has been adopted by various manufacturers and they've all put their own spin on it. Now the engineer behind this, or the man credited with a lot of the innovations in this rifle, is a chap called Ken Turner um, and he deserves to be credited with what he achieved here. This isn't the same as an HW77 it may have similarities um, in the way it functions, but it's not the same beast. Um, there are mechanisms in here which are designed to avoid metal on metal, which don't exist in the uh, in the Virox, or they didn't at the time these were current and the Virox model was around. It's also, it's possibly the better looking of the two. I mean, it, it is a very attractive rifle. And most of that is down to the stock, I have to say. And there is a very famous Chinese copy of this rifle, which is the BAM B40 and later the SMK XS41. And I do have one of those. And my plan is, and always has been, to do a head-to-head -head with both these rifles. Now, the thing is, the SMK is a 0.177, this is a 2.2, so there's going to be some, some differences. Um, but... Uh, to put them together side by side and to shoot them side by side might show you why this one is six to seven hundred quid and the other one's a couple of hundred quid. Um, hopefully it will. Now, I've got a couple of air arms. I am a big fan of air arms. I was always a big fan of BSA and of Webley because they were British companies. Um, yes, it's a German barrel. Yes, it's an Italian stock. Almost everybody is using Italian stocks on their high-end rifles and the Lothar Water barrel is very widely used. Uh, BSA don't use it because they make their own excellent barrel. Um, the Webley Stroke Hatsons don't use it because they make good barrels um, and also it would increase the cost of their guns. Water certainly have uh, Lothar Water barrels as do many others. Now I like this rifle for a whole host of reasons um, but rather than getting emotional uh, I'll just give you the facts um, as I understand them. Now I know the trigger on this rifle is widely revered and it is a very good trigger and I 
would say it's certainly on a par with the record trigger. It's one of the best sporting triggers there is, um, as is the record, and there are others out there which um, come pretty close as well. At the kind of price of these rifles, and the price of these rifles, as I say, six to seven hundred quid, um, you expect that level of engineering and accuracy and smoothness. And this cocks really easily, it's very smooth, even though it's the carbine with the short cocking lever, it's easy to cock. The anti bear trap on this, um, it has been used uh, on the LGU or something very similar to it, they've pretty much copied it very effective is a three-stage lockout system so it can it can fail and still work if you get what I'm trying to say um, my Viroc works on the principle that when you cock it it engages the safety and locks the trigger so the trigger can't accidentally be pulled and release the mechanism but if something was to fail mechanically inside the rifle it certainly could uh, and I've heard of instances where that's happened not with a Viroc but these things can happen so this is a different beast as far as the safety of it is concerned. Uh, you can actually decock this as well. Um, you know, you need to be sensible about it, but you, you can if, uh, if you feel you need to. The general sort of uh, feel and uh, demeanor of this rifle is certainly designed for the field, I think. I mean, I know people use them for target shooting and they are very effective and HFT, they still win prizes and competitions. Um, but this short one was designed to be lugged around. Now it's not light. Having said that, I think it's quite a bit lighter than the LGU and probably than the Walther RM8 as well. Um, but it's not a light rifle. So I've gone for a fairly lightweight scope. It's still a good scope, but it's not particularly heavy. On the whole, I would say um, for the cost of this rifle, because this would be something you would buy and you would, <clears throat> I like to use the term heirloom rifle. These will be passed on from father to son and grandson because they're that good. Um, 2005 model, it's been treated to a new spring and a, and a bit of a spruce up. And by that, I mean lubrication. That's about it. It's a good, working, accurate, long lasting and reliable piece of equipment. And it is a piece of equipment. Although it's a very attractive piece of equipment, ultimately it's a tool to fulfill a job. And, and that job is out in the field, hunting vermin, controlling rabbits, keeping the grey squirrel population down. It's perfect for that. Now, everyone talks about PCPs now. Everyone shoots PCPs and loves them. I've got to say, with a PCP rifle, to me, that's like driving an automatic car. With a spring-powered air rifle, that puts you back in control. It's like a manual, you get feedback. You know exactly what's going on with your gun. Now, I'm not saying that PCBs are as good as springs, and, and obviously I'm not saying that everyone should rush out and buy a Springer, because it might not suit you, but if you are going to buy a Springer, my advice is, as usual, buy the best you can. Now, I've got some really cheap Chinese Springers kicking around here. Actually, I had one out this morning, um, and it is really good, really accurate. It's pretty well put together, and it looks nice, and it's about 200 Pounds. Whether it will still be doing that and looking like that in another two or three years time, who knows? Maybe I'll come back and update you. Um, it's an XS208, I think. Really, really nice, solid rifle, but it's not one of these. Now, there's another layer to all this. Although this is a very accurate rifle, and it's a pretty easy rifle to shoot, and some of that comes down to the balance, the carbine gets over one of the issues that they've, they've got on the full length version, which is they tend to be a bit muzzle end heavy. Well, shorten the barrel, solves the problem. There is weight back in the stock and they do have this big cheek piece back here, which does tend to transfer their weight back into your shoulder. So it's not a difficult gun to shoot, but because you've got that weight there, it also dampens down some of the recoil because it's a spring power gun, there will be some recoil. Not a huge amount. And they're also surprisingly quiet because they are in a way silenced, it's a shrouded barrel, and the last couple of inches of these is what they call a plenum type of silencer, a very basic type of silencer. But it's also threaded. Now, Mark II, this one's female threaded, and I have an Air Arms silencer with a male thread. It's a standard half inch UNF thread on there, but it's the wrong way around for most rifles. You can buy an adapter. The adapter's something like about 12, 
15 pounds, screws in, and you can screw on any silencer you like, or you can buy an air arm silencer, uh, which is good to go. I do like Virarch silencers, I do like Huggett silencers, but there's nothing wrong with that silencer. With that silencer on this rifle, it is really quiet. I don't think you get it any quieter by buying a different brand of silencer. Now this particular one has got a rubber cover on it. Um, I don't know where I got that from. The, the silencer's air arms, but that cover is, I don't know where. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some shrink wrap on it when I get around to it, but I haven't done it yet. So I'll just pop the rubber on, which is tactile, makes it easy to get hold of and tighten up and loosen off, and also protects it. Um, sometimes I have in the past stuck some sticky carbon fiber stuff on there. Um, it's not a great idea. Looks nice for a short while. The other thing is, of course, that stuff is um, affected by heat. So it's, it's on a black surface, it's on a black gun. If you're out in the sun, it warms up and it, it uh, starts to bubble sometimes or even crease. But maybe that's just me. Perhaps I'm doing that wrong. Anyway, back to the matter in hand. Air Arms TX200. Now this is a first look, just to really familiarise myself and everybody else with it. It's going to be used in the head-to-head -head challenge and I'm going to do some shooting with it on its own before I do that. Um, I'm not going to shoot today, this is just literally a once-over. Now the quality, uh, the engineering of this is just incredible. You'd be really hard pushed to beat it. I'm going to put some close-ups in, because I've done this for all the other breech loading rifles but the breech in there is absolutely perfect it couldn't be any better in fact let's cock it all the way down you'll hear the anti-bear trap three clicks and the last one brings in the safety so the safety is on and the bear traps locked and that lever now can't be moved even if I disengage the safety and pull the trigger it just moves a fraction that's all literally just a fraction and you can decock it if that's what you want to do I'm not going to, because so I'm going to fire a pellet in a minute, I think. Actually, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put a pellet through. So I'll come back to that. So to release the lever, you've got a nice big, huge button on the side, similar to the author idea. I wonder where they got that from. Close that back up. That's a, a ball bearing indent on there, which is adjustable. So if it should become a little bit slack over time, you can take up the slack, keep it nice and tight. Now, uh, Standard scope rounds, it's got three stops on there, so it's pre-drilled, and as long as you buy scope mounts, which have got a, a locking screw in, you can actually lock them, you can stop any creep, which you probably want to do on just about every spring gun in existence. There's that trigger again, it is such a nice trigger. Um, that's really about all I'm gonna say about that, I think. I'll pop the silencer on just to show you the length of it with a decent sized silencer. Because this is about as long a silencer as you're going to use on anything. So even with that's a good six inches of silencer on there, this is still a nice, compact, manageable rifle. There we go. As I say, it's not light, but it's not overly heavy. And if you're careful with your choice of scope, try to keep the uh, weight down by not putting a huge optic on there you won't really feel the difference so coming back to air arms as a company they are british uh, everything is assembled in the uk they buy their stocks from Milani in italy and they are german Lotha Warfare barrels which are all good quality items and used by other manufacturers you're not going to buy anything better for the money you'll buy similar things for more money and you'll buy worse things for less money i'm not a snob i'm not someone that thinks because a rifle is an smk or it's a milborough or one of the many other brands beeman crossman i don't think they're inferior most of them are chinese to be fair um, a lot of them are good rifles uh, the remington express is a prime example has turned out to be a great little rifle. Um, another example would be the Hatson 60S, which is one of my favorites and one of my most accurate rifles. Now this is a very accurate rifle, once you've got your head around it. Um, pretty much all the Chinese rifles I've got are good. You can get a 5P group of 25 yards. You'll get the odd flyer and uh, you won't really understand why that's happened. When you get a flyer with one of these, you'll know what's happened because you'll know that it's you. 
It's a similar thing with the Virox and perhaps the Walther LGU was, was one as well. Um, when you shoot 20, 30 pellets into a target and one of them is not where it should be, you don't assume that it's the pellet, you assume that you've done something wrong. Now when you've got one of your Chinese rifles that's cost 150 quid and you've fired 20, 30 pellets and there's two or three that aren't where they should be, you think, well, it could be a dead pellet, maybe, you know, maybe it's a flyer. Um, but you don't get that when you get out of that that price point, once you get into the more expensive rifles. There are exceptions, and I've got a friend who's spent a lot of money on air rifles. I won't give you the brand name, don't want to upset anybody. Um, but they spend more time back at the shop being repaired than they do out on the range being fired. And they are a very well-known UK-based company. Anyway, that's enough of that. So there's a rifle, I'll do some close-ups, just a little montage of some bits and pieces and I'll be back very soon with a shooting video and then that'll be followed up with the head-to-head -head with the SMK B41 and this Hunter Carbine TX200. So that's it for now. I think I'll play out with the montage and I'll see you all again soon. Bye for now.